Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. It's good to be here. Welcome, everybody. Truth on the Web Ministries and Church of God at Woodstock, our weekly Sabbath sermon. I'm going to start off here with a got a little book here. I found it in a used bookstore. It's so like a reprint from something in the 1800s. Sabbath readings for the home circle. Some nice stuff. Some nice stuff in here. So um, there's a little story here I'm going to read. Just a page out of it. Um, it's called The Fence Story. I thought it's very apropos. So a man who prided himself on his morality and expected all to be impressed by it was constantly saying, I'm doing pretty well on the whole. I sometimes get mad and swear, but then I am strictly honest. I work on Sabbath when I'm particularly busy, but I give a good deal to the poor, and I never was drunk in my life. This man hired a canny Scotchman to bend a fence or build a fence around his lot. He gave him very particular directions. In the evening, when the Scotchman came in from his work, the man said, Well, Jacques, is the fence built, and is it tight and strong? I cannot say that it is all tight and strong, replied Jacques, but it is a good average fence anyhow. If some parts are a little weak, others are extra strong. I don't know, but I may have left a gap here and there a yard wide or so, but then I made up for it by doubling the number of rails on each side of the gap. I dare say that the cattle will find it a very good fence on the whole and will like it, though I cannot say that it's a perfect in every part. You can see the analogy there. He goes on, and it's kind of a, um, a Nathan and, and David kind of parable where he sees the, the folly in his own thing. So, but just think about that. Think about how, what do we do in our own, how do I, in my own mind, how do I have that? So I have, okay, here I'm a little weak, but I'm a little stronger here. Or maybe even we just think, well, it's not such a big deal that I'm weak there. Maybe we just have got to the point to where we're not even necessarily convicted of the weakness that our own moral character has. That's even worse. That's even worse. So I just I, I like that. There's some really good little little stories in here, good edifying, thought-provoking ones. I like this book very much. Something else, too, I'm not going to read out of this, but it just was interesting. There's a, a guy, I don't understand why. <laughs> It seems like Calvinists are really good holiness preachers. To me, it seems like the, the doctrine of Calvinism, it wouldn't matter. Why would you really preach holiness? It doesn't matter. You, you're either in or you're out. You don't have any choice in it. You know, you have no choice. It's not, it doesn't matter if you, what you do, but it just really does. So this is a book named Holiness, actually, by J.C. Ryle. It was written about 100 years or so ago. It's, uh, I've actually never read it all the way through. Um, I've made attempts at reading through it a couple, three times. Um, but... Uh, it's very convicting. There's parts in it when I'm reading, and it's just personally, it's very convicting. So I'm not going to read it again here, but I thought it's apropos to the subject, and it was sitting on my desk because I want to go through it again. So, um, so I thought I'd just bring that in. So, so with that being said, we will start off with the sermon. So, <laughs> Jeez. I, I guess, well, and I was going to interject this in the middle somewhere, but I think now would be a good time before I could start with the slides. And so we talked about this before. I think we actually even made like a little Facebook group. Um, John Wesley, a couple hundred years ago or so, had what they call the Holiness Club. So it would be men would voluntarily join this club. I don't know what, but, but essentially what it was is that they had a set of questions that they would ask themselves, and I think they would probably discuss amongst each other at different times what their answers were or where they were falling short um, to help uh, review their own holdings. So I'm not going to belabor this and go through. There were 22 questions here. Some are good. Some are eh. I, so, and actually, I, I'm going to dig into a couple of them in more detail on the slides a little later on towards the end of the sermon. But I just wanted to mention this, that I think more than anything else, just reading through these questions calls my own conviction, my own um, desire to pursue this life of holiness that he's put within me in the question. Like, well, how do I really, I mean, if these men truly did this, and even if they didn't, we know there were certainly men in Scripture that did live a holy life, that they were very dedicated to living as he would have them live. Um, how do I stack up against that? Not as a contest, not as anything, not as anything that will earn my salvation, but as... Um, an expectable and proper response to what he has done for me. So we're going to dig into some of this holiness here. Some of this is going to be a little bit of a, 
an extension of the last sermon I did, that progress perfection. Um, yes, and purification. So we'll start off here with the, and you may remember this from a couple of years ago. If not, that's fine. The parable of the ice cream. So actually, so the, the, the picture looks like, ah, it's going to be about mixing the holy with the unholy. So, but really, that has nothing to do with that. But it's a good illustration of that also as well. We're not supposed to do that. So you have the holy vanilla ice cream, perfect and pure and white. And then you have that chocolate stuff that just ruins the taste of everything. And so you would never want to mix it together. But it actually has nothing to do about it. So the, the, parable, <laughs> the parable of ice cream. Um, so there's two young children, and they both love ice cream very, very much. And neither of them has had ice cream in like forever. And mom tells each of, them, each of them that if they want to, right now at this moment, they can walk down with her to the ice cream stand and each get their favorite ice cream. It's a hot summer day like it is today. The ice cream would be really good. It's not the Sabbath, so it's all good. Um, but the reactions of the two are very different. One is so displeased with the prospect of having to walk to the store that he decides he doesn't even want the ice cream at all, and he starts to pout. Whereas, whereas the other little girl is so overjoyed with the idea of being able to walk down there with her mom that she even forgets about the ice cream, and it's just like, well, I get to walk down there with my mom. So what's the reason? Why are their reactions so desperately different? Well, the little boy... I just got a brand new bicycle. First bicycle he ever had. He just learned how to ride it. He just got the training wheels off. And now his mom is going to make him walk down there. He can't take his bike. So all he sees this is as taking away his pleasures and taking away the fun and making him do something that is a burden. I've got to walk. I don't want to walk anywhere again ever in my life. I want to ride my bicycle. So he gets so mad that he pouts and he doesn't even want the ice cream. Whereas the little girl, upon hearing the promise from her mom, who she trusts, the promise that she can walk down there, because the little girl is wheelchair bound. And so the idea of being able to walk is like, oh, that's incredible. I've always wanted to walk. And so even the prospect of being able to do something that she's formerly been denied doing is so great that she even forgets about the ice cream. The ice cream's not even the point anymore. It's the fact that, that there was something that she had been prevented from being able to do previously that now our mom promises you can do this. So the same it is with holiness with us. So some of us will see this idea of holiness, this idea of being obedient to our Heavenly Father um, as a burden, as the fact that we're being denied things that are our pleasures, we're being stopped from doing stuff that we want to do, and we're being made to do stuff that we don't want to do, boring old stuff, going to church singing hymns, listening to sermons, whatever it might be. So our Heavenly Father is looking for those who are seeking holiness, whose hearts have turned to Him and hunger after righteousness, after holiness. Not as a burden, not as a denial of what we think we're missing out on, but as a promise. As a promise, thou shalt not steal. To one who is a thief and who is truly pricked in the heart by God's Spirit, of the fact that their thievery is a sin and wrong, they would do anything to be able to live a life free of stealing. They would, and, and if somehow in their mind they were just what people call today a kleptomaniac, but it's just someone who has just stolen so much to the point to where it's like an automatic reflex reaction where they just see some shiny bobble and they just reach out and grab it and put it in their pocket, not even consciously thinking of it necessarily, for someone in that state to be able to be offered the opportunity who is convicted about their, the fact that they shouldn't do that, to be able to be offered the opportunity that you never will have to do that again would be a great blessing. Like, oh, thank you so much. Not a burden like, oh, man, now I'm going to have to walk around all the time. Remember, don't steal this, don't steal that, don't steal. We're not supposed to steal. We aren't supposed to. That's just an example. So let's take a look at some verses here. One that Kevin gave away in his prayer. Nice prayer, by the way. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So that's a promise. Again, it's not, it is a command. Absolutely, it is a command, but it's also a promise. Because we can't be holy on our own. We have a certain amount of righteousness. Um, every human being has the opportunity and ability, apart from God's uh, spirit, indwelling spirits, to be able to be kind to each other, to be helpful to each other, 
The world is full of many people who aren't as depraved as they possibly could be. When I was in the world, before I was redeemed, I mean, I wasn't, I could have been a lot worse than I was. I'm not bragging one way or the other. I mean, I was worse than some and better than others. But so this, is, again, is a promise. Oftentimes it's looked at, and especially in some of the circles we travel in, as a, a thing to beat over people's heads. Like, look, you're not being holy. Be holy. Be holy. No, it's a promise. Those who, those who don't hear it as a promise, those whose hearts aren't excited by the prospect of, wow, I can be holy, there's something wrong with your heart. That's what I want to talk about. today. Hebrews 12, 14, we see here, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So we're going to talk about it again some here. I talked about it last sermon. Um, the difference between justification or righteousness and sanctification or holiness. So here we see also in Revelation chapter 22, verse 11, as Jesus is talking with John, or the angel is talking with John, he says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. So we see that the contrast there. So unjust is the opposite of being righteous, or unjustified versus being justified. So whoever, who, he, who, he or she who is unjust, they're going to continue to be unjustified. They're going to continue to be unrighteous. And filthy is the opposite of holy. Whoever is filthy, whose ever garments are tarnished by their own sins, um, they're continue, they can continue and they will continue to do that. But he who is holy, who has washed his garments, continue to be holy, continue to keep your garments white. So I want to, those two things, there's two separate things. I know it sounds like I'm trying to be real nitpicky and technical, but I think it's a very important distinction that we have to understand. And I think that, myself included, I think that the church as a whole, including the people in this room and probably the people that are hearing me on the Internet, don't really understand the fullness of what this means. The, the reason that it's important to have those two separate in our mind, to understand the ramifications of each. So, I, like I said, last sermon I talked a lot about the fact that once you can't be more perfect than having been redeemed and forgiven of your sins. You can't be more perfect than that. That's as perfect as you can possibly get. doesn't mean that we don't become more holy, more sanctified, but you can't be more perfect than that. Once you have been forgiven by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, unless you live to the point to where you have denied that forgiveness and thrown it away, you can't be more perfect in the sense of being justified. You either are justified by his shed blood or you are not. There's no gray. There's no in-between. And I do not believe that there's any kind of in and out. I think once someone is truly, I think Scripture is clear, that once, some, once someone truly has accepted the forgiveness and the shed blood of Jesus Christ and has been justified by that and acknowledges that if they are to at a later time turn from that, I don't think there's another chance of going back. I just don't. So again, that's not me. It's up to God who will judge, but I say that as a warning to myself as much as to others. So let's take a look here, a couple little words here. I'm not real heavy into these, but I want to do a couple of them I thought would be. Um, so Strong's number, um, Greek 1342, is diakios. And it means equitable, or by implication, innocent, holy, just, meet, or righteous. So it means to be right or justified before God. Um, now there's always overlap in concepts. I'm going to read a couple scriptures here. So as you'll see, this word sometimes is translated as holy, but the concept that it's talking about here, we might still use the word righteous in a couple different ways too, like I am righteous before God by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, or I might tell someone out with a righteous action that you just did, or what you just did there was righteous. So we kind of use it in both ways. So when the translations go, we have to take it in context. But in the sense that we're talking about it, this righteousness that we're going to read about here, is about being made right before God. Where at one time I was a sinner and I was doomed to be destroyed in the fire as a result of my sin. And then at a point in time, God forgave me and he cleaned my sin away by the shed blood of Jesus Christ and I became righteous, I became justified. Acts chapter 13, verses 38 through 39. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. 
and Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So this is righteousness and justification. We are forgiven. And as a result of this forgiveness, it gives us opportunity to do things that before we couldn't do, just like the little girl in the wheelchair couldn't walk. As a result of this justification, this forgiveness, we then can do things that we could not formerly do. So we'll read a few of those things there. James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous or a justified man avails much. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, we read here. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And I want to read one more verse, and then we'll go over these here in Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So prior to being justified, being forgiven, we did not have access to the throne to stand before our Heavenly Father and make petition of Him in the name of Jesus Christ in time of need, which is always, by the way. Um, and so when James says the prayer of a righteous man availeth much, the prayer of an unrighteous man doesn't. God doesn't hear the prayer of the wicked. But the only prayer of the wicked God will hear is, please forgive me, I repent. He will hear that. But then the person is no longer wicked. They're no longer, they are then righteous. But the prayer of a righteous man avail us much because our Heavenly Father's ears are open to such prayer. So these are things that we receive as a result of being justified. We can now walk in these areas of our life where previously we were not able to. In Titus chapter 3, verse 7, we read here that being justified by His grace, we should be heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Not only are we able to petition the Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father, by the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ. But we also live in hope of eternal life. We have received that hope, whereas before we had hope only of destruction. In John chapter 10, verse 14, we read here, I am the good shepherd, this is Jesus, Jesus talking, and know my sheep and have known of, and am known of mine. So we are now known of God. God now knows us. God knows everyone, of course, but he now knows us as one of his children, as one of his family, as one who has received the promise and is destined, apart from aborting our own life, to live with him forever. So just so the idea of just being made righteous before him, of being justified, has a, a great number of benefits. But that certainly is, and those benefits are wonderful, to have hope, to be able to be um, to go before our Heavenly Father and petition Him, those are great things. But if that was the only reason that He justified us and redeemed us, then it seems like it would make sense that once we are justified and redeemed, He would just kind of take us out there and bring us on home. I mean, what would be the rest of it? What would it be for? So there is more to it than that. So let's take a look here at another Greek word of the New Testament, obviously. So Strong's number 40, hagios, which means sacred, physically, pu physically pure, morally blameless, or religious, ceremonially consecrated, most holy one thing, a saint. So in other words, to be set apart for a purpose. So this same word, hagios, that's translated holy, is also translated saint or saints 62 times in the New Testament. So these words are almost synonymous. It's like... I was thinking about it on the way up here. It's like, why did they name the football team New Orleans Saints? What was I don't know what the what was the reasoning behind that? What was the thought there? I guess I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, it seems to make uh, it it seems to make no sense. The Saints, anyway. A saint is a very specific. It's a title. It means something. Ephesians chapter one, verse one. Paul says here, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints, which are in Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. 
Here is the patience of the saints, of the holy ones. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, so that we are justified, we are redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and as a result of that freedom that we have received by that justification, we are obedient, eagerly, our heart hunger and desire for that. The few other words in the New Testament that are translated to holy or holiness or similar words here. So uh, Strong's 40, we read Hagios. Uh, Strong's 41 is related. Hagiotes. Where's Brian at when you need him? Um, which means to sanctify, that is the, properly the state of holiness. So that's like the state of being holy. So that's a person. So I am, I am Hagiotes, for example. Um, and then we have Strong's 42, which is Hagiosene, um, which means sacred. In other words, that's a quality of holiness. So they're all related. They're just different, different forms of the same word, and they're used a whole lot in the New Testament, of course. Um, and if you read the Septuagint, those same Greek words are used hundreds, I think, probably hundreds of times for sure in the Old Testament, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Here. So they're essentially synonymous. So holy, holiness, being holy, being a saint, those are kind of all synonymous things. They mean the same thing. So um, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath made before ordained that we should walk in. So we are justified by the gift of God, this is our righteousness, unto good works, which is our holiness. We are not saved by our holiness. We are saved by our justification by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We had a discussion um, here before the sermon about... Uh, someone who came around and expressed a, a very emotional desire to apparently repent and, and become a saint um, who committed suicide last, last Saturday. So it's that, it's the parable of the sower. We have to always, again, that, that to make me look down at him, or but think about myself. It's like, think about me. What I need to make sure that I'm on the beam. I have no doubt whatsoever that that I have been redeemed by my, my wonderful Heavenly Father, by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, I know there's work before me, and I need not fear. Nothing's going to trip me up. There's nothing that can pull me off the side, except for my own desires to leave him and go pursue something else. And that's why Scripture is so full of these admonitions and encouragements and and ideas so that my mind can be on these things, so that I continue to walk the course and run the race. Romans chapter 6, verses 19 through 22. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. So we are his servants in righteousness that we have been redeemed, we can go before his throne and petition him so that we can live a holy life. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. When I was servants of sin, I wasn't redeemed. I was free from any of that. What fruit had ye in those things whereof they are, you are now ashamed? For the end of these things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So it's clear that righteousness is, is what saves us from condemnation. And holiness is a fruit of righteousness. Holiness doesn't save us. At the same time, if one is righteous, they will bear fruit. So, are we saved without holiness? Let's take a look at an example here. Um, this is the parable of the wedding supper. Matthew 22, we're going to read 1 through 14. I've got 1 through 6 on the screen here. And I actually think, so in the, the context of what Jesus is talking about, well, we'll, there's actually a few ways you can kind of dig into this parable and look at it. There's definitely, as with many parables, there's more than one point that you can extract out of it. 
but I'm going to focus on, as we've been talking about here, the difference between being justified and holy and being justified and unholy, thus not being justified anymore. So we'll start off here, Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. So there are people who are made righteous. They have an invitation to receive eternal life. They have been invited, and they had accepted. They RSVP'd, yet we're going to come. However, when the time actually came, and they would not come, again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them what you're bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. So again, they were invited. And even though at first blush they seemed reluctant to respond to the invitation in its fullness, he's merciful and loving, and he sent more. And he said, Hey, look, this is really, you really want to come to this thing. You don't want to miss it. But they made light of it. I went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and, and treated them spitefully and slew them. Again, this is the parable of the sower. It's the same idea as the parable of the sower. They were given this wonderful gift, this opportunity to receive eternal life. And in the end, they rejected it for one reason or another. And as a result of that rejection, we pick up in verses 7 to 11. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he set forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. So they no longer received the feast, the banquet, the eternal life. They were destroyed. Even though they had, they had the ticket, they were already in. But their lifestyle did not, did not reflect the invitation. And as a result, when the time came along, their desire was not to receive the reward that they had been promised. Their desire was to do other stuff. They had left the path. They had counted it as a common thing. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore unto the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. So again, it says as many as were found. So I didn't necessarily say that everybody else came or was invited to the wedding as many as they found, as many as heard their voice. So good and bad. So in other words, men who were... So for example, Paul, the Apostle Paul, before he was converted in, in Acts chapter 9, he was still a very zealous, godly man. I mean, his heart was for God. He was deceived. He was wrong. But nonetheless, he was a good man in that sense that he was zealous for God. That's why when, when God came to him, on the road to Damascus, his response was, well, what should I do? You know, when he says, is it hard for you to kick against the bricks? I've been goading you and, and prompting you. Is it hard for you to do that? And his response was, what would you have me do? And that's why later he could say, I did it in ignorance. Now, why he was ignorant? Probably because God kept him that way, because he had a purpose. But nonetheless, so this isn't saying, and the bad would have been men and women who were men and women who heard the word and said, you know, I shouldn't keep living the way I'm living. I need to turn and go to this wedding. So they were all bidden. People came. And when the king came to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. So again, this is another example of the same. So just like the first group who were bidden and refused to come, he rejected. The second group were bidden, and yet some did not keep themselves holy. They did not keep their robes white. And as a result, what happened? And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So again, they were just, this man here was justified, but he was filthy. He was unholy. He did not have the clean white garment. And as a result, he received the same denial of the promise that the first group had for the same reason they received the forgiveness they were forgiven of their sins and yet they refused to accept it and live as a result of it paul here drives this point home galatians verses two through three two through three 
This only would I learn of you, receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? No, we are not. And he goes on to say in chapter 5, verses 4 through 6, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. This is the, this is the, the person who has been redeemed, and then they're audited in their fence, and they're saying, I know it's weak here, but I've made it real strong here. So the strong over in this section makes up for the weak section. So overall, on average, it's a good fence. They're trying to justify themselves by their own works, by their own perceived holiness. Even if they are a very sanctified, holy person, it doesn't matter. If we have rejected the shed blood of Jesus Christ, then we have no hope. Paul goes on to finish up here. He says, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. So again, this is where, and it's understandably so, that it seems like there's, it's confusing. It almost seems like it contradicts itself. Some places it talks about, well, if you don't do this stuff, you're getting stolen. We just read the parable out of Matthew, out of Matthew um, 22, and then we hear, read here Paul saying, well, no, your works don't do nothing for you. So which is it? What is it? It's a very, I cannot, so I can understand why this is one of the topics over the centuries has been a big conundrum for people. And people have gone all kinds of ways and all kinds of routes. Um, and remember, we read the verse before in Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. And there's many other such verses that say the same kind of thing. So I think it's really not as complicated as it seems or as people make it or as I have tendency at times to make it as well. Let's take a look at what Paul says here in first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. He says here, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in Christ. And in Hebrews 13, 9, we are warned here by the writer, be not carried away with diverse or about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Not with meats, which have not profited them, which have been occupied therein, that we be on the foundation of grace. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, I don't have a slide for it, but for no other foundation can man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the chief cornerstone. Doctrines, ideas can drag us off the foundation. Our heart is to be established in faith by grace, and we will yield the peaceable fruit of holiness. We will. Psalm 40, verses 1 through 4. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock. So think about it. Where I was in a pit, a pit of miry clay that was so slimy, there's no way I could climb out. It wasn't, if I was willing to be honest with myself, enjoyable being down there in the slightest, no matter how hard I tried to convince myself otherwise. And that was my condition apart from him before I was redeemed. That was the condition of the, the girl in the wheelchair in her hopes to walk. There's nothing. She was trapped. This is the gift that we get from him. He lifts us out of that horrible pit of our own sin and our own, our own doom, and he sets our feet upon a rock, Jesus Christ. And he established my goings. And then he put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. He changed my heart. He put a new song in my mouth, that one that desires holiness, that should, that should bear forth the fruit. And again, as I said, I'm not, I'm not sitting here holding myself up as some great one. I'm sitting here holding myself up as a man who has been redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ and in whom the Spirit of God dwells and who should be living a holy life. And so if I am not, it is my action that prevents me from living that holy life. And so these scriptures and these things make me think on my own life. And what am I doing? And what fruit am I bearing for him? So I certainly am not looking down my nose at anyone in this, but I expect that probably many who are listening to the same thing might be having the same thought about themselves. And I hope so, if it's true. I put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. 
Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Those are some big, big verses. So as I said, Christianity is not some secret puzzle that needs to be solved. It's not some secret society. I found this on the internet. It sounds on church. True, correct. So this is a secret society at Yale College over the years. There's all kinds of different skull and bones and the beehive thing and whatever, all that, you know, all kinds of stuff. So this, Yale's not unique in this. There's all kinds of stuff, secret societies. So we can look at those things and we can kind of maybe scoff a little bit, maybe because they didn't invite us in part ways, but nonetheless. But how often, what, how much stuff do I have that's not this overt that's the same way that I think somehow oh, this is the key, this is the trick, the gimmick that I found. This is why it works for me. Um, and, and so I'll give an example. The list that I, that I mentioned, and we'll, we'll look at a couple of things, you know, this holiness club list. So many of you might look at this and be convicted in reading it, and perhaps rightfully so, and then think something, okay, that's what I need to do. I just need to really be disciplined and do this every night and be honest with myself, and then that will be what will solve my problem. No, it's not. It won't solve your problem. It won't. There is no combination of, of knowledge and tricks and actions and things that will solve your problem. There's only one thing that will keep you progressing in the walk of the Spirit, and that is to earnestly pursue holiness. That's it. It's not, there's not, these things can be helpful. Reading Scripture every night isn't going to do the trick for you in and of itself. Remember, for most of human history, most saints didn't have regular access to the Scriptures. They couldn't do that. So if that was something that was required to be able to maintain holiness, they were in trouble. And yet, it seems like they did a pretty good job. And you read scripture, you read um, accounts of saints in times past and what they did for the word of God. So it's not some secret society. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Many places teach this kind of stuff. Modern Christianity falls short because of some hidden thing or some context that is required to be able to understand. So that's how... That, that's how many people's ears get tickled. I have been in the time past guilty of it myself, where I, where, where I, if I'm honest with myself and look, it's like, you know, there seems to be something missing. So then I hear some little thing, and it's like, oh, that must be it. That's a danger sign there. One, that there's something missing in me. If I truly am his, I have his spirit. What can be missing? So if there's something missing, it's because I have decided that I need something more than what I have, or I have committed some act or refused to commit some act that I should have done that has put me in a position behind the eight ball, so to say. It's not a secret thing. It's not. Are there things within us that we are not aware of? Certainly. Uh, Psalm 19 is a great one, you know, showing to me my secret faults, those things that are in me that I don't, you know, my motives. Do I necessarily always 100% know what my motives are in something? No. I've been around long enough in my own flesh to understand that there's some times when I am fooled by my own motives. And I think my motives are such and such, and I later discover, no, they were not such and such. They were this and that. So I don't live in fear of those things. I live in awareness of that fact, and I live in prayer to him that he revealed to me so that if I am deceived, I don't end up too far off the path, and I don't hurt others in that deception. But he is loving and merciful, and he will forgive. I remember this. Got up at work. Got a new a new guy. Well, he's been there about five months now. So it's a pretty technical job. So there's a lot of stuff you got to learn. So it's a pretty slow learning curve. It probably takes about a year and a half or so to start getting proficient enough that you can really be independent. So so the nature of it is that in the beginning you make a lot of mistakes, and it's really a lot of it is how you learn. You just got to do it and make the mistakes and. And, and, and we're there to catch them, so we don't let the mistakes go affect other people. But, but that puts, puts me in the role of often having to go through and check his work and then point out, you know, okay, this, this shouldn't have been done this way, this should have been done that way and such and everything. So, and, and this young man, he's pretty good with taking that correction. He's the last guy that we had who isn't there anymore. He would get defensive very easily. You know, it was difficult to, to work with him. It was difficult to, to teach him. Um, so, but one thing that's always in my mind is that I want to make sure Tom is his name. 
that he realizes we're for him. It's not, even though it seems like sometimes it may be somewhat adversarial in the fact that I'm saying, hey, you did this wrong and this wrong and this wrong. It's, we're not, I'm not doing that to show you that you're wrong. I'm doing that to show you that you can be better. Here's what should have been done. And so that we're for you. I mean, I've had the opportunity on several occasions to tell you that, you know, remember, we're for you. We're for you. We want you to succeed. We want you to. So it's, it's, it's nice to be able to do that, especially when it's received by people and they believe that. It's like, yeah, okay, so yeah, that was a little tough. I probably maybe should have done a little better there, but you're not out to get me. You really do want me to succeed. So. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to rest. So he's not up there with a lightning bolt waiting to zap me. He's not watching me. Aha, I caught you now, buddy. You're in trouble. No, he's not like that. He isn't like that. Acts chapter 17, verses 26 and 27. Paul tells the heathen, the pagans here. And he, may, he hath made of blood all nations of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far, from every one of us. So he is for us. He is not against us. He wants us to see. He died for us. <laughs> I mean, that seems to make no sense at all. That he, he went to all that effort, and then at the slightest opportunity, he's going to be like, oh, I got you, you're out of here. God's not like that. Humans might be like that. God is not like that. In Hebrews, talks about, in Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about chastening of the Lord. You know, and that each and every one of us endured chastening from our fathers. Um, and they chastened us oftentimes based on their own self motivated interests. You know, they didn't like the fact that we're running around upstairs at nine o'clock at night keeping them awake. It wasn't necessarily that being up at nine o'clock at night is a sin in and of itself, other than they said, don't be up at that time. But nonetheless, it was kind of a rule they made up because it suited their purposes. Um, you know, you see the. The, the mother in, in Walmart or the supermarket or whatever, and the little, the little child's having a temper tantrum, and, and most of her, if she's in the flesh, most of her reaction is more of embarrassment of everybody else seeing what's going on with the child than a real desire for the well-being of the child, although the child shouldn't be acting that way, of course. So nonetheless, even our fathers, they chastened us, and they gave us the, we gave them reverence. But our Heavenly Father knows everything perfectly. He knows exactly what we need. He never gets miffed at us or embarrassed about us or anything like that. That his, his correction to us is always for our best so that we are more conformed to who he is and to the image of his son. John chapter 18, verses 19 to 21. Again, it's nothing secret. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple whither the Jews also resort. So in other words, they were all there. Same place they go, I was there. And in secret have I said nothing. Why ask thou me? Ask them which heard me. Why, what I have said unto them, behold, they know what I said. So it's not secret. So yes, you certainly read in the Gospels where... There were times when Jesus would talk with just the disciples or even the subset of the disciples. For example, he took just three of them up onto the Mount of Transfiguration and he told them afterwards, don't tell any man of this until after I'm glorified. But it wasn't a secret and it was with the intention that it will be told to everyone. So none of these things are secret. He didn't, it's not the idea that somehow this is a code that has to be cracked. No, it's not a code that has to be cracked. Not in that sense there. Is there, de are there depths of knowledge in here and revelation and deeper relationship with him as we continue to submit to him and to seek him out through his word, through, through prayer, and through obedience in the spirit? Absolutely so. Just as in any relationship, the longer it goes on and, and the more committed the people that are in the relationship are to the relationship and to growing and strengthening the relationship, it will get closer, of course. But it's not a secret. It's not anything hidden. Many people have that idea because I think that 
if they're honest with themselves, they think there's something missing in their Christianity. They think there's something missing in their faith, in their walk. And instead of turning to the very simple core of the very source of everything that might be missing is my lack of relationship with him, my lack of obedience to what he has already revealed to me, not to some secret thing that might come down the road that I don't know, but something that he has already plainly made clear to me and that I have refused to do or I have done that I should not have done. And the good news is that if I'm still able to conceive those thoughts in my mind and realize I have made a mistake, that he will allow me to repent and turn from it and forgive me. Second Timothy chapter two verses nineteen through twenty one. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. That's it. He knows those who are his. He knows those whom he has redeemed by his shed blood. That's the seal. The seal. That's the earnest of the spirit. That's it. If we are redeemed, we are forgiven of our old sins, we receive his spirit. That's it. He goes on to say, and let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So in other words, if you have been redeemed, then depart from iniquity. That's not how he knows us. He knows us because he has forgiven us by his shed blood. But everyone who he does know should depart from iniquity. But in the great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. There's not a big mystery here. I'm going to read another parable out of Matthew here. We're going to read Matthew 25, 31 through 46. I'm only going to emphasize a couple points here, so we'll read through it fairly quickly. I have 31 through 36 on the screen here. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me drink. I was a stranger, and he took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? So here is the confession of Christ himself. He did all these things. You're blessed of my Father, and no one will come and enter in your reward. And not only on top of that, but they're, they're humble about it. They don't even realize that a lot of stuff that they even did. Why? Because they were busy, focused on the task in front of them, and things happened. So I, I think Ken mentioned it briefly, and I think most people probably listening to us are aware of the coincidence that occurred last week with the prayer from the young girl, Lydia. But so that prayer actually was uh, came from um, an email from a man in... Oregon, I believe, or Washington State, to another one of the one of the people that's on the broadcast here in Canada, who forwarded it to us, um, seemingly out of the blue per se, um, and then we happened to mention it on the broadcast last week, and Ken happened to type in the girl's name in the chat so that people who actually didn't hear it mentioned saw the name typed in, and the people who saw the name typed in actually physically know the people that were being prayed. Now, how is that? I mean, obviously, God is at work for those things. That's incredible. It's amazing. So God knows these things. So I think it's so important if we submit to him and obey him and listen to him, things will go on. We're not even, we won't even know about it until the kingdom. And then we'll find out about these things, that we can be agents for his glory and edification for his saints that we're not even aware of. If we will be honest with ourselves and live holy and righteous. He goes on to say here, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, and as much as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. 
Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in, naked, and ye clothed me not, sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So first and foremost, all these people know who he is, and he knows them. So this isn't ta- so Jesus, our feet are on the rock, so Jesus is the rock. You've got to be set on Jesus. So that doesn't mean just because you, you do prison ministries or whatever that you're going to receive eternal life. Remember, he said, you got to set your feet on the rock first, but this is a simple illustration. It's not mysterious. Everybody reading this can see, well, what's the difference between the two groups? It's how they lived their lives and what they did. One group was, was kind and holy and helpful wherever they had the opportunity, and one group was not, and that was the difference. That's the difference that Jesus did in this illustration. Now, going back to the idea that somehow then, oh, okay, now I know the secret. Now I know what the secret is. Now, so I need to go and set up soup kitchens and water stations and go to the hospitals and go to the prison ministries and everything, and then that will ensure that I am one of his. No, it won't. No, it won't. There are going to be many people, Matthew chapter 7, many people on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do many wonderful works in your name? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do all kinds of miracles? And he's going to say, I never knew. Get away from me, you worker of iniquity. So this goes back to what I said before. There is no magic formula. There is no trick that you could conceive in your own mind to somehow be disciplined enough to follow this stuff and think, God, now I'm in. No, our dependence is always upon him. It always is. That does not negate the fact that there are things that we need to do. We are to be obedient. Yes, we're supposed to do those things, for example. Yes, as opportunity presents itself. But doing those things is not the secret. It's not the answer. I, I, um, so at work, we have this, uh, they, they do um, occasional um, philanthropy projects and stuff. So they do different things. And so they have, they're just right across the street from work is one of those places that um, as volunteers come in and pack up meals and stuff, they send off to third world countries in Africa and, and uh, Caribbean and such and everything. So um, we get opportunity every once in a while to go there, and it, it's called Feed My Starving Children. And and they don't make any the 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 rhetoric at least at the user is very Christian. I mean, they say you know we want we want to shed the love of Jesus Christ by giving food to the you know and they, so they they don't make any um, any excuses for that whatsoever. But I think many people again get the idea. See, this is what being a Christian is about: feeding the poor, doing that. So somehow that's that's not the trick, that's not the gimmick, that's not what. And and conversely, there are other people who think things like you know keeping Sabbath and the high days and not eating pork, for example. It's just it's just variations of the same theme. It's the idea that somehow there's something missing in my faith and my walk. And now oh now I heard this guy on YouTube talking about this, and oh that should be great, you know. Or or I was at work and I heard some coworkers talking about all oh, the great work they're doing in the mission field digging wells for all these disadvantaged families and everything, and I was so convicted and felt so guilty because I'm not doing that kind of stuff. Maybe that's what I should do. And so, so many people, and I'm subject to it too, can get drawn away by that stuff, and then your life becomes a whole set of obligations that we have created, and it quenches the spirit and chokes the spirit out. And if at best we'll make it through that, and all our works will be burned up, and we'll just be there and barely make it in. I don't want that to be the case. I want to make it in having glorified him because of what he's done for me. Romans 2, verses 13 through 16. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, 
in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my God. So here Paul is making it clear. It's not, it's the fact, are we being true to what God is putting in? It's not, here he's admonishing the, the Jewish Romans um, about their, their reliance and their pride in their heritage and their lineage. And he's saying, look, God is the God of the whole earth. He's got people all over the world. He always has. And he works with them. And even if they don't know specific things, they are true and faithful to what they do know. And their conscience is clean. Rightfully so, it's pure. Not because they have justified in their mind sin, but because they have been honest to what God has put into them. John 15, verses 1 through 2. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges, that it might bring forth more fruit. And skipping down to verses 5 through 6. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So again, think about this example Christ is using here with the vineyard. So the, the, the branch of the, of the vine hasn't done anything in and of itself to be part of the vine. Whether it was grafted in or whether it grew there naturally, it of itself did nothing. And a vine isn't going to want to kill parts of itself off that are bearing fruit. It's not out looking to trip things up, to find problems with stuff. It wants, it wants things to grow and flourish and bear fruit. So again, he is for us. So only when we refuse to bear fruit, only when we refuse to live life unto holiness as a result of his redemption, will he cast us out. So we don't need to fear the fact that somehow there is some secret hidden thing that's going to trip us up We only need to fear the fact that our own hearts can be deceived and lead us astray. And he has the remedy for that. Contact with him in prayer, obedience to his spirit, study of his word, and fellowship with other saints that can help exhort us and correct us if needed and encourage us always. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works, those who thirst and hunger after righteousness. He has redeemed us out of the world. He's put a new song in our mouth. Holiness unto the Lord. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whosoever a man sow, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So this is talking about someone who is redeemed. If you are redeemed and justified and then you continue to sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. You will be cast out. But if once having been redeemed, ye sow to the Spirit, then you shall reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men especially unto those who are of the household of faith. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And in Romans 8, 31, Paul tells us here, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can us? So again, I want to 
pause here and encourage everyone to be introspective, to think about these things. So if, if you were called to the table now to account for your life, would you want to hide under the table because of the time you've been wasting? Maybe you haven't been doing horrible, abominable things. You know, maybe you've been you know, much better than before. Maybe you're still one of his. It could be. But would you be able to stand and not arrogantly, but humbly know, yes, because of what you have done in me, I have done these things for you. Paul in Thessalonians, I believe it is, writes, you know, that he says that the Thessalonians are the epistle, the evidence to God of his holiness, of the work that he did to glorify the Heavenly Father. In Psalm 40, we read there where it's like many will be converted. That new song will cause others to hear, and then many will fear the Lord and turn unto him. We read here in Job chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus talked about the patience of Job. Uh, and this response that Job has here is an amazing response. I mean, you read this and you think, wow, it's definitely a holy man, a righteous man, a man who knows God. So the question is, how, how was Job able to do this? How was he able to earnestly worship God and have this response? Well, Scripture actually gives us that answer. In Job chapter 1, verse 1, it says here, There was a man in the land of Uz, and no, it's not living in Uz. That's a secret, so don't go move into Uz. That's not it. His name was Job. That man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So there you go. So he was perfect. In other words, he had been justified, and he eschewed evil. He feared God, and he was holy. Anytime anything evil came across his path and his heart and his mind, he rejected it and turned from it much as Joseph ran from Potiphar's wife. In verse 5, skipping down here, we read, And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So Job was constantly seeking God, seeking for righteousness, even for the righteousness and the love and the care of others. And Job, by the Spirit here in verse 22, and all, and all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So Job was known of God. Job knew God. Job feared God in the sense that he did not cower in the corner hiding from him, but he understood the great gift that he had been given and didn't want to use it lightly. He didn't want to just toss it aside. And he eschewed evil. So anytime anything came along in his path, in his heart, in his mind, out from outside influences um, that might have caused him to, to blaspheme the name of the one who had redeemed him, he ran from it. So this isn't, it's not secret. It's not, it's, it's a tall order. In fact, it is an absolutely impossible order apart from the Spirit of God. But it's not. So I, that's very encouraging to know that it's not some secret formula that we've got to know. That it's very simple. It's not. No one. We don't have to send somebody up into heaven to find out. Well, what's the secret code? Or down into the deeps to find out. It's very nigh unto you. It's in your lips. It's in your heart. He's put it there. It's in His Word, and it's in the lips and the heart of His other saints. Think on these things. Proverbs 27, 19. As in water, face answers to face, so the heart of man to man. And in James chapter 1, verses 22-25. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding the natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. 
pay attention to what's going on in your own heart. Each of us needs to do that. I don't think I have a slide for this. If I do, then we'll just read it. Second Peter chapter 1. I'll just read verses 8 through 10. So, For if these things be in you and abound, they make that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Seek holiness. Understand that we stand on the rock, that we have been justified, that at any time and at all times we can go before the throne and petition our Heavenly Father, that we have an advocate with the Father, that when we do sin, we can ask for forgiveness and move on to better things by His Spirit and through His forgiveness. But we need to move on to better things. We cannot continue. It was a, a sentiment that I saw one of the social social medias this week, where it's that idea that somehow, and, and it, there is truth in this, is that each and every one of us has a, a sum of life experience that has somewhat shaped and formed who we are, you know, what our character is, what our personality is, um, and, and none of us really knows that about even the, the even husband and wife don't fully know that about each other. There are things that you just don't know. You haven't walked the entire life in the shoes of anyone. So we should always realize that when we see something that seems askew without further evidence of like, well, we shouldn't just automatically judge. We don't know a whole situation, so we shouldn't jump to judgment. And that is true, but many try to use that, and I am sure I have in time past tried to use it. Um, it's, not a, it's not a new trick. They, Adam and Eve tried it in the garden. It's like, well, God, I know, you know what you're saying. I shouldn't eat of it, but... That woman, if you understood that woman you gave me, you would give me a break. You would cut me some slack. Trying to justify my current incorrect, unholy action based on something that has happened in the past that really has no direct effect on what I'm doing now. Anyway. Don't do it. Don't justify. Again, there's no magic method that will keep you holy. There's no gimmick or set of gimmicks that keep a person in the zone. There's going to be hills and valleys, times when it seems easier to walk with him. And these can be actually the most dangerous when it seems to be easy and things are going good. They can be the most dangerous. Like, hey, so, oh, things are going good. Oh, I'll go check this out or whatever. Sometimes when things are more difficult, it seems easier to hold on to him and seek him out. But nonetheless, that doesn't mean that when things are difficult, we will always do that with the proper spirit. The gimmick is to stay holy always. That's the trick. That's the gimmick. If you want to look for a gimmick, you want, you want the trick, that's it. Stay holy. Period. Thus, we will not cut ourselves off. Jeremiah. Skip the slide there. Nope. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 through 10. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreads out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat shall not see when heat comes, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his womb. That sounds scary. But to those who earnestly understand that we are just before him by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and those who truly do search after righteousness, that's a wonderful promise. We should, I should, be more than eager at any point in time to consciously bear my soul to him and ask, what is in me? What do you find in me that is unholy, that is not from you? Please cast it out. He knows it already anyway. It's not like it's a secret from him. But just as Adam and the woman tried to hide in the garden behind the bushes, we somehow get this dichotomy in our mind to think that somehow it looks like God doesn't already know all of this. That's just more of a testament of his love and mercy for us is that he does know these things, and he doesn't just, but that's it, I'm done with you. He doesn't do that. Yeah, right. Why are you hiding? Don't, come on out. Don't hide. 
Yeah, right. Locate. Yep. Yes. Yep. So um, I did pick a, a couple, like three or four little um, questions out of this list, the holiness code list. I thought they were, again, they're not the gimmick, but they are things that can be helpful. I have found them over time helpful for myself. Um, there are areas, I think, where we are prone to, where I am prone to, to fall short. Um, and there's no excuse for it. If I do fall short in these areas, it's because I have turned from him and not accepted the grace that he certainly has provided for me to overcome those things. So one of the first ones here is, and, and this isn't in the sense of salvation necessarily, but just in the sense of like defense story. You know, things in our lives that are not an example of eschewing evil. They are not examples that would stand up next to Joseph's reaction to Potiphar's wife. Am I self-justifying? Proverbs 18, verse 17. He that is first in his own cause seems just, but his neighbor comes and searches him out. Here Paul tells us in chapter 3, verse 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And actually, I want to read a few more verses around there, because Paul really drives it home in that little group of verses in Philippians 3. I've got a moment here to find where I want to start. So as I'd mentioned earlier, you know, Paul talks about, I'll pick up in verse 6 here. So concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for, lost for Christ. Not because they were in that, now of course, persecuting the church and blaspheming his name, that needed to go. But many of the, the, the things that Paul did were proper holy things. He, Paul lived a holy life in general. Um, so he didn't, it doesn't mean that he quit doing those things, but he did not hold those as anything of any real worth before his heavenly father when he went before him in prayer. It's like, oh, look at, I did these things, and he didn't have like a little bag of stuff that he like pulled up. Oh, you remember when I did this and I did that? No, he counted it all loss for what? So that he could do new things and brag about those things? No. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So to be known of him and to know him. That's the gimmick. That's the trick. That's what, that was the core of Paul's holiness. That was the core of Paul's discipline and energy and concerted effort in the gospel throughout his whole life was this desire to be known of him that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, neither or either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. <coughs> so I read through verse uh, 12, or 13, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me there. So Paul, again, is making it clear. What's the trick? What's the gimmick? Set all that stuff aside. Yesterday's stuff, it's all gone. I can learn from it. I can benefit from it. It can be helpful to others. It may have drawn me closer to him and brought me into a, a better relationship with my Heavenly Father. But nonetheless, today is the day that is in front of me. And today is the day that I need to walk holy, that I need to understand and know of a certainty that I am justified by his shed blood and that my feet have been set upon the rock that I've been given his spirit, and that I can live a holy life. Zealous for good works. Don't self-justify if I find something that is not correct. Don't for a second. Cast it aside. Get it out. Ask for forgiveness for it and move forward. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? 
but we kind of scoff at this, ah, uh -huh, you know, and then he gives the um, the parable. But nonetheless, we got to realize, do I do that kind of stuff? Where do I justify my own actions? Where do I justify things in my own mind or to others that are wrong, that I should not be doing? Where, What do I allow myself to do that God has already clearly told me, no, you shouldn't be doing that, and given me the ability to not do it? Or what do I not do that I should be doing? I, I was talking about uh, our new employee, Tom, so I hope, I, I mean, I can't read his mind or discern his heart, but I hope his intent is to be the best employee he can be, that he takes advantage of every opportunity that we give him to grow an understanding of how to do his job, and that he wants to be the best possible employee he can be, and that he doesn't make excuse for himself. Um, so think about ourselves. In our daily, I think about myself, in my daily walk with, with God, is that, I mean, do I, am I zealous for good works? Am I zealous in all things that I do, in all things that I think, in all things that I say to glorify him? Am I zealous in these things to do what he would have me do in these manners? And again, it's so easy then to automatically start making little lists of stuff. And then you make boxes that people got to stay in. You can't do that. There are things that we need to obey and do, but we have to constantly seek Him. That's what's difficult about it. That's what's hard. It's not because it's secret or hidden. It's because it takes continual effort. Because as we read that in Jeremiah, my heart's deceitful. If I continue to let it lead me, I'm in trouble. Because it is susceptible to those things of the world and those lusts in my flesh. Now, if I stay with him, then my heart is pure and clean, and I can trust it in that sense because it will be led by his spirit. Another area, am I a slave to dress, friends, work, or habits? Here we read in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. You can't serve two masters. So if there are things in my life, um, Brian talked about it. Where did he go? He out there? Okay, so <laughs> Brian talked about it um, last week very well, too, that idea of, you know, don't what, what's going on? What in the world is pulling me away? What can draw me away from doing what God would have me do? I need to pay attention to that stuff. Romans chapter 6, verse 20. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. We read that whole set of verses a few slides ago. So when we were servants of sin, we were free from righteousness. So it didn't necessarily bother me as much. Um, it might have bothered me a little bit, but I found encouragement and justification in other things. Don't let that be the case. 1 Kings chapter 18 Verse 21, and Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between, between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Again, how long will I be halt between two? That's not, you don't, <laughs> there really are no, ex, no good examples in Scripture of people who were, who were chronically of that frame of mind and ended up very well. We, there are definitely examples in here. Balaam, King Saul, for example. There's many examples of people who were of two minds. They wanted to do this and to do that. But as far as I can remember, there's not a good example where someone was chronically like that, and all of a sudden some miracle happened, and they turned from that, and they became a real true holy person. That the holy men and women of God that you read about in Scripture once God got a hold of them and they turned from their, their wicked ways, they stayed turned and they fervently pursued a righteous life. It's just, that's what's in Scripture. And it makes sense. I mean, once you start, if, if you start off poorly, if you start off with a willingness to justify your own shortcomings, 
then that's going to continue on. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And every time we let one little thing slide and we make one little excuse for a sin, then the next time that comes around, it just doesn't bother us as much. And the next time around, it just doesn't bother us much anymore. Or we come up with more clever excuses and justifications for why, oh, it's okay. It's not, you know. James 4, verse 4. The adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. Here Paul says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So this especially in things about the world, dress, friends, work, habits, many things are morally neutral in and of themselves. Owning this car or that car, having this job or that job, living in this place or that place or whatever it might be. Many, many things in the world are, are in and of themselves morally neutral. They don't have a moral component to them in and of themselves. However, um, Paul here makes it real clear that everything that we do, we have to realize that as we read a few verses before, we can't serve two masters. So if you set your heart on something that in and of itself is not wrong, it can become wrong. Don't let anything become your master. Paul here is saying, there's a lot of things I can do, but a lot of those things will end up then being my master. I will have to serve them in one extent or another. Debt, for example, is a good... It's not... It, borrowing money, in Scripture, you can borrow money, but debt can very, very, very easily become your master. And then you're serving that master. It's not a good thing. Debt is one of the real common ones. He goes on to say, meats for the belly and the belly for meats. The God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. For the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. But we don't want to, his body, we are part of his body. We don't want to bring part of his body under the power of something that is outside of his body. Fornication or anything else. So, and that's what we do if we give in to sin, if we give in to these things and we allow them to be our master. Another area that they, that this holiness club requested people think about on themselves is, can I be trusted? So here in Zechariah chapter 8, verses 6 through 17, we read, These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false oath, for all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. Can I be trusted? Am I honest? Do I have my neighbor's best interest at heart? Am I, you know, do I care for them? Or am I eager to hear gossip about the other neighbors, for example? To hear no false oaths or anything? Do I want to just know what's going on? What's, what's everybody up to? Matthew chapter 5, verse 37. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. So in other words, what you say, do. You don't have to make some big, wordy, Oath about, oh, I promise, I swore in a stack of Bibles. What you say, do. Can I be trusted? When I say I'm going to do something, can people expect that unless there's something completely beyond my control that prevents me from doing it, that I'm going to do it? And that can happen. We read, Paul says, you know, many times I wanted to go visit you in Macedonia, but the Spirit prevented him. He wanted to do something, the Spirit prevented him from doing it. Those things can happen, but that should be by far the exception because... We shouldn't be running our mouth and saying things that God hasn't already cleared that we should say. So if we're, if before we speak something, we submit it before God to make sure it's something we should be saying, pretty much we're not going to be saying stuff that we can't back up later on. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 13 through 16. Thou shalt not have in thy bag diverse weights, a great and a small, thou shalt not have in thine house diverse measures, a great and a small. But thou shalt have a perfect and a just weight, 
a perfect and just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God gives thee. For all that, that, that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. So in other words, he's talking about here, don't be a respecter of persons. Not at home, not at work, not in public, not in church. Don't have diverse measures. Don't, don't judge one person one way and judge another person another way. And don't judge yourself most favorably, of course, which is what we're prone to do. It's very easy for us to justify our own actions and find fault with others for the very same thing. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't stop doing what they're doing if they're doing something wrong. But nonetheless, this is about ourselves. We keep ourselves holy. We keep ourselves pure. We keep our garments clean by His Spirit, knowing that our feet are planted upon the rock, and we will hear that award in the end. One last one here, and then we'll close up. This one here is quite convicting to me. How do I spend my spare time? So this is an area where it's very easy to go to extremes. Yeah, right, spare time is right. That's a, that's a good point, Jeff. Jeff is like spare time. It's like all the time that I am given is his time. So there really is no spare time. But in this sense here, how do I have, how do I spend the time that is not already allocated for other tasks? What do I do with that time? And so this is another area where it's very easy then to become very legalistic in the sense of like, oh, okay, well, so I can't do anything. You know, I got to make sure that every single second I spend is doing this, this, and this, and I'll come up with a list of whatever this, this, and this is, things that I think are the most important things that, you know, and certainly anybody that isn't doing this stuff, there's something wrong with them and they're reprobate. But at the same time, as Jeff mentioned there, it's his time. I need to redeem the time because the days are evil. So I don't have any spare time. Any time I have is his time. Am I using it in a way that I would be able to stand in front of him and not have to justify, oh, well, yeah, but. One of the big things that's spent with spare time is laziness. Proverbs 24, 33, get a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. But as Paul tells us, and I had mentioned already here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 16 through 17, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Redeem the time. It's been given to us in a world that wants to waste it. Redeem it. Matthew 6, verses 33 through 34. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And I think this one here too is on the same topic. In John 15, verse 13, Jesus says here, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But how willing am I, as the example in James, you know, when a, when a neighbor comes in the middle of the night knocking, hey, I, you know, I had unexpected guests, I need some bread, and I'm like, hey, I'm sleeping. Leave me alone. I don't want to lay down my life. I don't want to spend the time. It's not necessarily talking about physically dying, but in other words, oh, man, I was really wanting to spend some time watching this movie, and now you're calling and you want some help. I really don't feel like doing it. Am I willing to lay down my life, the things that are important to me, the things that I want to do for my friends? Because it's not really my life. So in closing, I just want to say again that I find this stuff very convicting for myself, that, that I, I really do want to live my life in a, in, a, in a manner that at any moment, he could just, like I said, call me to the table and say, give account for what you have done, and I don't have to be ashamed. But shouldn't we all want that? I mean, that's... So if, if we don't want that, if I don't want that, I have to realize there's something lacking in me. And it's not some secret knowledge. The lack is as a result of my resisting the prompting of his spirit and what he has already given. That if my life is not... If that is not the core of my life, then... I have fallen short somewhere because surely he has promised that I can be holy. 
and that I can thirst after righteousness and hunger for holiness. And so if my life does not reflect that truth, that promise that he gives us in Scripture um, as a result of being justified by him, then I have fallen short somewhere. And the good news is that I can turn to him and ask him for forgiveness and illumination on what it is that I have failed to do or what I have done so that I can move forward. And I encourage myself and everyone else to have that thought in mind. So I'll close here with Ephesians chapter 4, verses 21 through 24. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And that's my prayer for each and every one of us. So Godspeed, brothers and sisters. Have a wonderful rest of the Sabbath. We'll see you next week.